In Berlin, the CIA and the KGB find themselves face to face. The war between the secret services was one dimension of a much larger conflict, a confrontation that almost boiled over just under the surface of the Cold War. Peter Volta, agent in the service of the Soviet bloc. Between 1978 and 1988, he carried out nearly 100 tense trips between West Germany, where he lived, to East Berlin to deliver information. At the time, the metro crossed through the east part of Berlin. It slowed down through the stations, which were more or less in darkness. You could only see that the entrances and exits were blocked by sandbags. And in each of these stations, the police were patrolling with Kalashnikovs. That's what you saw traveling slowly through these ghost stations. It was a very distinct image of the Cold War. For nearly 50 years, while in the service of the KGB or the CIA, thousands of agents like Peter Volta were the cogs of the biggest information war in history. It started on the 2nd of May, 1945. The German war is therefore at an end. Two worlds now face each other. Two blocks clearly defined and in the heart of East Germany one city that will become a battleground. Berlin split into two. A new war is brewing, but this one won't be fought head on. It's a new type of war, a secret war of lies and intoxication. CIA, KGB, the aim of each is to establish their influence and impose their ideology. In the ruins of Berlin, there will be all-out war. The smiles and handshakes are forgotten. The winners are still not allies. Peace treaties have been signed. Americans and Soviets, the two main winners, don't have any energy left to fight each other on the ground. So each side sets out its pawns and watches. That's how the war of information begins. Here we have one of the key places in the Cold War, Tempelhof Airport. West Berlin wasn't situated just anywhere. It was in the heart of the sector of Soviet influence. It was a thorn in the side of the Russians, a time bomb just waiting to go off. Would Berlin be swallowed up by the Soviet Empire, or would it stay a free city? That was the basis of conflict between American and Soviet intelligence services after the Second World War. Relativ schnell nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg. In the United States, they soon realized that things may get stormy. The Soviets were a step ahead. They set up their intelligence service in 1917, 30 years ahead of America. 
a man is dispatched to Berlin to set up the first CIA cell on site. Peter Sichel steps onto the tarmac of Tempelhof Airport on the 1st of October, 1945. We had very little instructions of what to do. We had thought won the war, we wanted to enjoy life. We, we drank too much, we burned the candle on both ends. And it was only slowly that we realized that we had to wake up. They've always been good at the game. And they came into Germany with a team of people who knew the territory, knew the language, knew the circumstances, and knew security. We had to learn security. And it took us one or two years to do it. America had never been in the espionage business. The Soviets win the first battle, and it is brutal. Early in the morning of the 24th of June, 1948, the Soviet troops block the roads, railway tracks, waterways. They're hoping to cut off West Berlin with the blockade. This is the first of the KGB's plans. The Soviet Nachrichtendienst the information that the Soviet intelligence agency had passed on was the following. West Germany had such economic problems that it was a burden that the Americans wouldn't defend. Stalin saw an opportunity at a time when the two sides were trying to increase their zones of influence to finally get its hands on West Berlin. We could either send our tanks and force our way in, but that might cause the Third World War. We could accept it and agree to abandon Berlin, which for a time part of the American government wanted to do. Or we could try to supply Berlin by air. This was my job for the next nine months, 10 months, 12 months, to find out what the Russians' plans were. And by that time, we were professional enough to be able to assess that the Russians were not preparing to go to war. We were sure of that. We assured our government of it. Peter Sichel's agents know the exact state of the Red Army and the American government follow their advice. They set off the biggest airlift in history, for nearly a year, the dance of the aeroplanes doesn't stop. 280,000 flights mean that 2 million tonnes of cargo reach 2 million Berliners. The city won't be abandoned to the Russians. The CIA wins its first victory. Yes, the life of Berlin has been maintained. The airlift carries on. However, the game has only just begun. Since Moscow at the start of the 50s, Stalin is leading an ideological battle against the world. In Korea, Vietnam, China, the communists are taking hold. The KGB is still there behind the scenes. Berlin is the western limit of the empire. New agents are put in charge of strengthening its position. I agreed straight away to the offer to work for the KGB. I've never regretted it. We couldn't lose the GDR because it was the last defense against the socialist system in Europe. We absolutely had to protect it. That's why we planted our bayonet there. It was our army. As long as they were based there, nothing could happen to us. Georgi Zakharovich Sanikov, a pure product of the KGB. He finished his career as a colonel. He was 29 when he arrived in Berlin. The headquarters of the KGB, which terrified everybody at the time, Karlshorst, south of Berlin.
The place was well known. It was the Saint Antoine Institute, a former monastery. A few meters from the building where the Nazi surrender was signed. The information war was going to damage the loser. It was whoever went furthest and deepest into the enemy camp who would win and manage to bring back vital information to their government. To do that, we were prepared to use all means possible. At Karlshorst, nobody suspected what would happen next. The danger would come from underground. The CIA was secretly preparing a plan that could totally change the ratio of power. It became very clear to the Americans, British and French how little they knew about the Eastern Bloc. The Soviets had much more information. It was easy to get. There were telephone directories with details of all the American units, names of their directors and their phone numbers. None of that existed on the Russian side. That was when the Americans had the idea of building a tunnel to tap the telephone lines of the Russian military. It was a way of collecting a huge amount of information. They wanted us to find out where the cables were. And we found out through our contacts in the East German Postal Service, who were in charge of all the cables. I thought it was a great idea. <laughs> the tunnel was dug, 450 meters under the Iron Curtain to the Soviet telephone lines. From there, the CIA would use 600 agents who listened to half a million phone calls. For 11 months, they thought they had a key advantage, but despite listening into Soviet conversations, they found nothing interesting. What the Americans don't know is that a man has betrayed them. His name is George Blake, one of the British Allies agents. In reality, a double agent. He works for the KGB, and his role in the tunnel makes him a legend among Soviet spies. Blake was an extremely brilliant agent. He attended a meeting of British intelligence services in London in December 1954. It was there that he learned that the Americans were planning to connect to the Russian telephone lines. This operation had a code name, Operation Gold. Blake immediately understood the importance of this plan. And a month later, all of the information and technical brief for Operation Gold found their way onto a desk in Moscow. At that time, the KGB had to make a difficult decision. Should it stop the construction of the tunnel and risk compromising its agent, or should it let the Americans go ahead in order to protect their spy? Finally, the Soviets decided not to risk their agent. They let the tunnel exist for 11 months. 11 long months where their conversations were listened into. Then, when it seemed the right moment, the KGB revealed the existence of the tunnel.